Hey there fellow classic comic collectors, as always, I'm Scott Harris King, and today I'm going to be doing something just a little bit different. As most of you know, usually in my videos I'll be talking about old comic books, going over back issues in my collection, and then occasionally I'll also be talking about the creative process of making my comic book, The Crime Busters. Well, today I'm going to be doing both at the same time because I'm going to be looking at this classic comic book here, National Comics number 57. It's one of my favorite Golden Age books, and that's because it has the first appearance of Granny Gumshoe in it. Now, uh, I'm currently putting the finishing touches on issue three of my series, The Crime Busters, which itself is using public domain Golden Age hero uh, Crime Buster, aka Chuck Chandler from Boy Comics. And in issue three, I have a new version of Granny Gumshoe in it. And um, I wanted to go through this issue and show everyone um, the comic and the really great first story of the Granny Gumshoe, because I know a lot of people aren't familiar with Granny Gumshoe. But then I'm going to show you my updated version of Granny Gumshoe from the Crime Busters number three. And I'm going to talk in depth about the creative process of updating a Golden Age character and how exactly I was inspired by specific panels, lines of dialogue, and such like that in this story when I was doing my update. Um, so I'm really excited to show this off. I also just want to mention real quick, as I mentioned, uh, issue three of Crime Busters, I'm just putting the finishing touches on it now. The Kickstarter page is now live. Um, the pre-launch page, the launch itself is going to be sometime next month, but down below, um, there's the pre-launch page, so if you're interested, you can go there and it'll just have a button to notify me on launch, and if you click on that, then whenever it goes live, the Kickstarter will send you an email. Um, I'm also doing a thing now um, where I know a lot of people haven't had a chance to read the Crime Busters. Um, you know, the physical copies are mostly available just through Kickstarter. So unless you happen to live in the Boston area, you wouldn't have seen it like in your stores. Um, and so what I'm doing is I'm now giving away uh, the digital version of issue one for free, um, so you can read it at your convenience online. Um, I have the link down below. All you have to do is sign up for my mailing list. I don't spam anyone. I just send out a message once a month with updates on, um, what I'm doing and other cool projects that I'm seeing in, in the, you know, community. So if you're interested in that, you can sign up below again. Um, I only send out a message once a month, except I'll send out like a couple bonus messages during live campaigns. But if you're curious about the crime busters and you want to see what's going on, I'm actually going to be sending out a message in the next couple days. So now's the perfect time. You can sign up below and you'll receive a link to download crime busters. Number one. And last announcement before we get into the awesomeness that is national comics. Number 57 is I'm still taking entries for, my 200 subscriber giveaways so i've got the link to that down below i'll also have it up here above uh, so if you haven't signed up for that you still can and i'm still taking questions um, for my 200 subscriber ask me anything so if you have any questions about this video or anything in general just ask them below and when i hit 200 subscribers i'm going to be doing this mega video with answers to every question in the universe so anyway enough from the announcements let's get right to this awesome book national comics number 57. okay so here we are national comics Number 57, uh, cover dated December 1946, and National Comics is published by Quality Comics, and this is a book that um, originally starred Uncle Sam. So the Quality Comics version of Uncle Sam um, was the headliner and the cover feature um, for most of the run of National Comics, um, and then here we are, post-war this is over a year um, after the end of World War II, and of course, superhero comics quickly fell out of favor. And so National dumped Uncle Sam, and they replaced him with the Barker. That's the lead story uh, and character in National Comics for this era. And that's why we have this um, really, really awful <laughs> cover, because he's a carnival bar Barker, and so there's all these uh, carnies and stuff in it. Now, I'm not a big fan of the Barker, um, so I'm kind of just going to skim through some of these other features in National Comics 57. To be honest, I haven't, haven't really read all of them. Um, it's sort of like a bit of a, you know, comedy. There's some action stuff in it, but it's, there's a lot of comedy. Um, and then we get a bunch of, um, sort of like, almost like true crime, like, uh, 
detective stuff. Here's Steve Wood. Um, and then um, here's another feature. Here's Sally O'Neill, Policewoman Sally O'Neill. I do like this one. Um, I'm thinking about using Sally O'Neill in a future issue of Crime Busters. Um, so this is this is a good one. You can see my centerfold here is detached. So we're just going to be really careful there. And here we are at the center of the book. Right in the middle uh, is the, the feature that I'm really interested in that I love so much I want to share with everyone. It's Granny Gumshoe. So let's just go through the story here. You can see this is the first appearance of Granny Gumshoe. We got Granny. She's wearing this sort of uh, late Victorian era or Edwardian sort of outfit. And she's chopping down a tree and there's a ventriloquist dummy in the tree. Now, it's funny, this feature is only six pages long and they devote almost the entire full page to a splash. Um, it's not exactly the uh, most... Um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, efficient use of their their storytelling space. But um, anyway, here we go. Granny Gumshoe. And there's a lot of like uh, stuff set up right here <clears throat> at the beginning. So here's Granny. She's down in her workshop. She's working on something. It's actually a lamp. This is going to come in. That's going to be important later on. It says, somewhere in the suburbs of Weston lives a lovable old lady. No one have believed that this quaint person had a secret passion for criminal investigation and invention. These hobbies came in handy when Granny Gumshoe got involved in a strange adventure. It all started when her granddaughter, Lippy Lou, called Granny. All right, so here's Lippy Lou, this sort of annoying, like, six-year-old, um, who's sort of a wisecracking sidekick. And she's got in the newspaper, this famous ventriloquist is coming to now, and Granny's like, eh, who cares? But then she realized, oh, this is actually an old friend of hers from way back in the day named Hiram, Hiram Echo. And so she's like, sure, let's go to the thing. So meanwhile, we got Hiram Echo, and he's got his ventriloquist dummy. And um, he's like, he's had this weird premonition that his dummy is going to come to life. And says, this afternoon during my first show, the dummy spoke to me. I hadn't thrown my voice with the dummy at all when it opened his mouth, and it said, tonight, revenge. Um... I have a premonition that something against the laws of nature will happen. The dummy will come to life. Well, considering that already happened, I think that's a reasonable premonition to have here. Um, so anyway, he goes on to the show, and sure enough, right in the middle of the show, the dummy just goes off on him. And um, he's like, you get all the glory, I'm doing all the hard work, you know, go F yourself. And he stomps off. And... Um, Lippy Lou's like, wow. And Granny's like, huh, that shouldn't be happening. So she decides to run backstage and talk to Hiram. And she gets there just in time to see the puppet murder Hiram with a wooden fist that hits so hard it breaks his neck. Snap. And Granny's reaction is, um, extremely mild. She just goes, poor old Hiram. That blow from Splinter's, that's the, the puppet's name, Splinter. Splinter's hickory fist broke his neck. There goes the little rascal out the window. <laughs> so completely unfazed that her old friend was just murdered in front of her. Also completely unfazed that the dummy has just come to life. And she's like, oh, that little rascal. That's not normally how you would uh, probably describe um, a, you know, uh, vicious murderer. Oh. The scamp, that scamp just murdered someone. So she finds a clue as to who created the dummy here. And she's like, well, I better go talk to the guy who made the dummy. And that's exactly where the dummy's gone because he wants a woman dummy made as well. Okay, so here Granny is, is listening through the grate because she's apparently climbed up into the ceiling. And she's like, I invent, uh, this is a workshop, whatever. I invent the queer things like the spray gun built into my umbrella. But I find use for them. And so she sprays him with this gun built in her umbrella. And he's like, whatever, I could just I can just detach my arm. So what? Um, the dummy actually turns out to be a surprisingly difficult foe to beat, as we're gonna see in a minute. So he just pops a different arm off. And so she's like, okay, I'll plan B. So he gets away and she's reading her murder mysteries, and she like set puts a thing in the newspaper 
So he actually come and go into business, wish to sell pretty girl dummies. So he, she lures him with sex, of course. Um, there's going to be a hot dummy for sale. And so he shows up, and she's waiting there with a pistol, and she just blasts him right in the face. <laughs> she's not screwing around here, you know. Um, she's like, well, uh, see you later. And he's like, yeah, I'm a wooden dummy. I'm getting a shot in the face. Whatever, I'll just, I'll just putty over it. Who cares? She's like, haha, I've got termites. And he's like, oh, no. Yep, she's outthought him. So he runs over and jumps into this tree. She grabs an axe and cuts the tree down, and he dies. And she's like, well, and Lippy's like, why did he, what happened? And she's like, this is the hickory tree that he was carved from. The, so when I cut the tree down, he died just as the tree died. And here's the kicker. This is the kicker that that really, really sealed this one for me. I was just like, what the? So uh, here's the epilogue. The uh, the police chief comes over and is like, um, I want to see this dummy. And Granny's like, yeah, here he is. I was working on this lamp, so I just took his corpse and I put made it into a lamp for my den. The end. And I was just like... What the, what kind of twisted sadistic woman is this where <laughs> she she kills this sentient being and then uses its body as a decorative lamp in her office. So anyway, that's that's it. That's National Comics number 57, the first appearance of Granny Gumshoe. So now I'm going to go back to the beginning and we're going to go through it again, but this time um what I'm going to do is over here um let me get to the right page here. If I can turn, the pages are a little bit stuck together. I want to make sure I don't damage anything. All right. So um, here's Granny. What I'm going to do is over here on the uh, right side of the screen, I'm going to put up my um, updated version of Granny. Here's the Granny Gumshoe variant cover that will only be available to backers of the Kickstarter campaign. You can see the changes that I've made to Granny. And I'm going to go through this again page by page and sort of show exactly how I made the changes, not just to her look, but also how specific things that happened in this story inspired me to make um, certain decisions about how her character is going to be in the story. Okay, before I um, talk about the costume, uh, um, there's certain things about the character that it, that inspired what I did with the costume. So I want to talk about the character first, how I read the character and how the character, um, the updated version that I'm going to have in Crime Busters um, works. And there's certain very specific things in this story, specific lines, specific panels that suggested a whole character to me. Um, and I was really, really intrigued. Stuff they don't actually get into at all in these stories themselves, but that... Uh, it really inspired me to to work on Granny Gumshoe. The first part is this down here, right? Um, so she's a little old lady, and the thing here, of course, is she has this secret passion for criminal investigation and invention, right? And then, of course, the key panel um, is this here. This sequence here where she says, I invent the queerest things like the spray gun, built into my umbrella, but I find a use for them, right? Um, there's, plus, let me just bring, let me just show off a couple other things here. This panel was, was really instructive for me. Um, poor old Hiram, that blow from Splinter, Sacred Fist broke his neck. Uh, the things in this panel that really jumped out to me uh, that I kind of mentioned already are she has no reaction at all to her friend being murdered, but more importantly, she has no reaction at all um, to a ventriloquist dummy coming to life, right? And so combined with this part here, um, I definitely get the impression this is not her first rodeo, right? So she's invented, she invents all these inventions, and she always finds the use for them. This is the first appearance of Granny Gumshoe, and yet it's suggested in, in these panels, um, several things are suggested. She's an inventor that can make all sorts of great stuff. 
She's been doing this for a long time. She's seen all sorts of crazy nonsense, right? So she's she's seen enough so that um, a puppet coming to life doesn't eat, she doesn't even blink at it, um, and uh, she's her personality wise like when her old friend gets murdered she's just like okay there's a the thing that happened, um, again these all suggested to me someone that's been doing this for for a long time right and so when you look at the character this is 1946 let's go back to the beginning, right. This is 1946. So, say Granny is 70 at this time. Um, that means that she would have been born around 1876. And so, sort of the prime, you know, when she's in her 20s and 30s, that's going to start around um, 1895 and is going to run uh, up through about the beginning of World War um, one, right? And so we're talking Victorian era. We're talking late Victorian, early Edwardian era. And you can see that in her outfit. Um, it's very sort of of that time period, like 1910. Um, and so all of these things together just immediately scream steampunk to me, right? So we've got a person working in the Victorian era who sort of goes on adventures and solves crimes. And specifically, they're sort of weird adventures, weird enough so that a puppet coming to life doesn't phase her. And she uses all sorts of inventions and technology to defeat them. And so when you think of, you know, Victorian adventurers using technology to solve weird adventures, it's just immediate. you know, it's steampunk. It's just automatically, that's just exactly where my mind went. And so when I updated her outfit, I actually, you'll see, I took almost all of the elements of it from her original look, right? If you look at, if you look at the character here, um, Granny's got, uh, I, I kept Granny's hair. I kept Granny's glasses. Um, I actually kept the, the, this, I don't know if this is, this piece is part of her dress, but she's got this high jagged collar. This is like lace work collar. I kept that as well. She's got fingerless black lace gloves, which I love, and I kept that. I also kept her boots. She's got these awesome, um, like, leather boots that go all the way up to to uh, somewhere. <laughs> these sort of, like, I don't want to say thigh-high, but sort of, like, knee-high leather boots with the lacing and the big heels. Like, I kept all of those things. And, in fact, um, if, we, if we look here... Um, I kept her hat, same hat, the black hat. It's got um, a little ribbon, you know, a band around it and, and the two flowers on it. And I um, kept her umbrella. So all of those elements are from the original. The only thing I really did is I took the, the dress she's wearing, I changed it so that the whole thing was sort of a white or more of a cream. Um, and then I put this overcoat over it. And... Uh, obviously, you know, it, it's inspired by Mary Poppins. So I took the coat right out of Mary Poppins. This specific coat is something that Mary Poppins wears in the recent prequel. And um, when I was looking at Granny Gumshoe, she actually reminded me a lot of Mary Poppins, particularly her sense of humor. Now, in the panel that we that we showed earlier here, obviously, um, you know, Mary Poppins' sense of humor isn't this dark and sort of cynical and sadistic and twisted. But Mary Poppins, you know, she always has this sort of like, you never know whether she's joking or being serious and because she always seems to have some sort of joke that only she is in on. And she's always having fun with everybody. And I feel that way about Granny Gumshoe throughout this story where she's fighting this um, puppet who's killing people and her concern isn't so much about stopping a murderer or avenging her friend. The only emotion she really shows throughout this is how much fun she's having solving an adventure. Like in this panel here, um, when she's setting the trap for him, she's reading a gory murder mysteries pulp. And so you get the sense that Granny's sort of less concerned about the morality involved here and just stopping this killer puppet as she is the thrill, just the fun of it. Right. And so I looked at her very much as like, um, 
sort of a dark Mary Poppins. Like Mary Poppins, if 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 you consider Mary Poppins like a, to be like a chaotic good character, I see Granny Gumshoe more as a chaotic neutral character. Um, the other thing here, again, character wise, those are my two. You know, the, my my two main my main things here, main influences. Obviously, this story is suggested. Um, the uh, Mary Poppins, the the third much smaller influence, but I wanted to mention when I was designing my version of Granny Gumshoe is the Doctor. Um, I think a case could be made that Mary Poppins is actually an incarnation of the Doctor. I would love to see someone do a story like that if that was legally possible, which it isn't. Um, but if you look at Mary Poppins and the Doctor, they very much have a similar. A personality and mindset um, just and the way they function inside of stories um, is very similar so when I was designing granny and I was looking at her steampunk stuff like specifically how she's gonna function as a steampunk character part of my inspiration was the doctor now this sort of thing here is very much the doctor as opposed to Mary Poppins you know when the doctor um, gets upset or whatever, he can get very dark and he can have a very cynical outlook and sense of humor with things. Um, and so, uh, if you look at, at granny over here on the right, um, basically what I did with, with Mary Poppins, you know, she usually has the big carpet bag, um, that's just filled with whatever she needs in it. And uh, it's basically like a bag of holding. So I took that for Granny. I made it into a purse, but it functions sort of the same way. Granny's an inventor. And so um, I think I uh, look at her like sort of like MacGyver. Inside of her purse is whatever the story calls for. So um, if there, if she needs to build a device or, or rig something up or do whatever, she reaches into her purse and she's got some sort of doodad in there. She can always sort of um, put something together and whatever the plot calls for, she has it in her purse. That's basically, it's like, it's like the room of requirement in Harry Potter. It's sort of like the purse of requirement, whatever the story requires, she's going to have it in her purse. The other thing though, that I, that I took from the doctor really, if you look is that granny has, I gave her the, this, um, clockwork eyeball. So her right eye, um, is gears and stuff. And, uh, basically, this doesn't even come up really in Crime Busters 3, but we're going to be seeing a lot more Granny because I love the character. She's a very important addition in expanding the Crime Busters sort of universe. So we'll be seeing a lot more of her. Um, with Granny's clockwork eyeball is she has different lenses that she can rotate through that allow her to see different things. Um, like she can see magic with one of the lenses. She can see like on the infrared. She can, she basically uses it to diagnose things. And so between her purse and her clockwork eye, I sort of look at that as her um, sonic screwdriver. And of course being, being um, uh, a steampunk character, I had to give her a Zeppelin um, so I gave her a Zeppelin that's sort of like her TARDIS. She doesn't time travel, but she can fly around at high speeds on this souped up Zeppelin. And then I also gave her some companions. Um, I, I reworked Lippy Lou. There's one thing in here after reading through this and a couple of the other stories that occurred to me that sort of really informed how I was going to work on Lippy Lou. And that is that um, Lippy Lou here, Lippy Lou is... is um, it's said that she is Granny Gumshoe's granddaughter. However, none of these stories, I haven't read all of them yet, but none of the Granny Gumshoe stories I've read make any mention of Lippy Lou's parents. So there's, whether it's Granny's son or daughter, there's some generation in between the two that's missing. And so that sort of just suggested to me a whole backstory for both of them. So Lippy Lou um, is not this sort of wisecracking, like sort of streetwise annoying imp. In in Crime Busters, she's she's a different uh, treated very differently because I worked out a whole backstory with um, who she really is and and her parents and you know whether Granny Gum she's actually her biological grandmother and all this stuff. I don't want, no spoilers. It doesn't really matter for the purposes of the video anyway. But the point is even the little things in this that aren't in the story. The omissions in the story can inspire the way you design these characters. For me, again, there's a lot of subtext 
that came out when I was re- even the first time I was reading this, I was like, so Granny, she makes a bunch of inventions and she always finds the use of them. So what were her previous missions? When I read this, like I loved the character, I loved the story, but I immediately wanted to know where did she come from? How did she get to here? What was she doing in the 70 years to get to this point? And that just opened up all these things in my mind. So yeah, I just wanted to go through uh, the whole process. Hope you found this interesting and just the process of taking these old characters or any character really and sort of reimagining them. There's all sorts of stuff in the text and then there's omissions in the text and all of those things um, hint at different aspects. Even if characters have sort of blank spots, those blank spots can actually be the things that allow you to be the most creative when reworking the characters. Luckily with Granny Gumshoe, um, her last issue is 71, so she only appears in 14 issues in National Comics, um, or 15 I guess, and so she she just doesn't have a lot uh, to work with, and that gives me a lot of leeway. But even for more established characters, just I would suggest if you're going to be reworking the characters, take a close look at um, the stories and all of these little clues can hint at all sorts of interesting opportunities to be explored. And that's really what revamping a character is, is exploring what it is at the core of that character that makes you excited to use them. Um, So anyway, hopefully this has been interesting and helpful for someone. And um, thanks very much for watching. I'll see you next time.